community in real life, setting the table for co-living with our alumni, Profit Walker. It is presented by the LMU Real Estate Advisory Council and the LMU Real Estate Alumni Group. We'll get started in just a few minutes, but first I'd like to go over some guidelines for today's webinar. Type your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. These questions will be moderated after the main presentation. Use the chat section to post your comments only. And a friendly reminder that this webinar is being recorded and will be available after the presentation. And now I'd like to introduce our, our Dean, Dale Smith. Thanks, Nancy, and welcome, and welcome everybody. We're so glad that you're here. Um, my name is Dale Smith. I'm the Dean of the College of Business Administration. And just a shout out to all of the members of our real estate advisory group, um, both alumni of the uh, real estate alumni group, as well as our advisory council. Um, in a minute, I'll introduce Carla, who will introduce um, our, our guest speaker. But I did want to say that I was so tickled when I read uh, our, the bio of our speaker tonight, because he really speaks to what business school is all about in terms of our mission of advancing knowledge and developing business leaders with moral courage and creative confidence to be a force for good in the global community. And to bring speakers who have made a success out of thinking about things from a triple bottom line orientation really sends out the message of what differentiates us as a business school and our business and expanded business community. So with no further ado, let me introduce you to one of the members of our real estate Advisory Council, Carlo Matricardi. Carlo, over to you. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Dean Dale Smith. Uh, Carlo Matricardi here. I'm Managing Director of Carthay Group. I'm also an alum, a proud alum of Loyola Marymount University. I graduated with a dual degree, business and Spanish, uh, a couple years ago. Uh, I, I just, I'm really, really thankful for all the staff at LMU uh, for putting together our marketing and coordinating the, these events. Uh, these are a series of events, obviously, that our Real Estate Alumni Council has put together in coordination with the uh, Real Estate Society, the student group. Um, REAC uh, provides guidance, advice, and feedback to the LMU College of Business, business Administration on business and employment trends in real estate. The council offers direction on how to improve the real estate curriculum and partners with the Real Estate Society, as I said before, a student-led group to organize extracurricular activities and educate LMU students about careers in real estate, current trends. Uh, REAC is proud to provide annual scholarships to select students who are interested in the real estate industry. We just recently funded a certificate program training uh, for courses for students to help them be better prepared for jobs in the commercial real estate industry. We are looking for additional council members and invite those interested to reach out to Evan Deems, our new member, or uh, our new member coordinator and treasurer. Uh, in addition, any students should contact Sophia Booth to become a member of the Real Estate Society or to learn more about events like their monthly speaker series uh, that is uh, continuing. So without further ado, I wanna give an opportunity to, I'm, I'm super excited to introduce Prophet Walker, who's also an alum. He's co-founder and CEO of Treehouse, uh, running through his bio, he grew up in South LA uh, at 16, was incarcerated, uh, sentenced six years in prison. While in prison, he started a statewide program uh, that allows inmates to earn two-year college degrees. Prophet then attended LMU and earned a degree in civil engineering, Seaver. We're glad to have him here at CBA. We, we, we brought him to CBA. Uh, Prophet's experiences uh, surrounding community strength and human connectedness inspired him to create Treehouse, recognizing the power of community and proximity and shared humanity. Prophet leads the company with a focus on acquisitions, research, property selection, and investor relations. Without further ado, we're, we're very, very happy to have uh, Prophet Walker. Thank you, Prophet. Of course. Thank you, Carlo. How are you? Good, good. Um, it feels good to have all those introductions out of the way. I'm Absolutely. super excited to get a chance to have a conversation with you. You, um, in addition to having a really amazing story that I am benignly envious about, um, <laughs> you're, you're in uncharted territory. You have a new product type in the commercial real estate field, and you're doing ground up development. Where should we start, Prophet? Where, where would you be comfortable starting? This is a big uh, story. 
Yeah, where, wherever you'd like to start, it, it is. It's, um, you know, understanding real estate. There's so many moving parts of real estate and there's a tremendous amount of complexity generally. Um, and that's, you know, I, I, I tend to have a lot of respect for anyone in any component of the real estate business. It requires so much uh, hustle and grit and, and thoughtfulness while also uh, protecting yourself and many other people and, and balancing it all while, um, you know, trying to deliver something particularly special to people. I think uh, delivering a home in any shape, form, or fashion, sh fashion is, is pretty special. So um, wh whichever point you'd like to start in the real estate cycle or industry. Uh, <laughs> Why don't, I mean, I think it's appropriate to talk about um, Treehouse and where, yeah. where you guys are at, kind of what that genesis looked like. Uh, you know, I remember I heard about you guys. I was at a co-working space mid-Wilshire and I heard uh, a talk about Treehouse and it was going to be a new co-living space and in Hollywood. And, and I heard that it was you know, first time real estate developers, and I was hooked, you know, I was a fan from there. What was, what did that genesis look like? Yeah, so, you know, it, it started with, um, I think I'd always been thinking about it, right? I, you mentioned some of this, my background growing, uh, growing up and, and just, you know, becoming more of an adult. And, when I when I looked back when I look back over my my life, I remember being in South LA, which most most people would consider like Watts and South LA Compton. You hear all the big headlines of negativity, um, but one of the most powerful and impactful things I had ever experienced, frankly, in my life, was a deep seated sense of community. Um, everyone was connected, and we were connected uh, for better or worse to the struggle. Um, and in that struggle, in that struggle, we were committed to looking out and protecting and providing for one another. And I experienced some of the most gracious and the most like selfless giving people truly in my life, growing up in one of the most poor situations I could be in, um, at least in America. And, uh, Equally, when I was incarcerated, um, again, another scenario where people would look at uh, objectively and be like, this isn't great. <laughs> and, I, and for a host of reasons, it isn't. Um, but it also was another moment of tremendous community for me that, that meant a lot. And then I think the next time at which I felt a compelling sense of community was frankly at LMU. Um, you know, I... Uh, I got to come onto a campus where everyone smiled, everyone was happy. I remember uh, being welcomed from everyone from Jade Smith to Christine Felkel to, you know, Charles Mason, and, and the list just goes on and on, and my professors and, and then friends, and really feeling this, like, sense, this incredible hug, you know, um, you know, some of my, uh, my lifelong best friend. Um, I think probably for the rest of my life came out of LMU and I, I remember chasing this idea of getting out. Um, I wanted to get wealthy and get out and I had a chip on my shoulder. I no longer wanted to be called an ex-criminal. I no longer wanted all of these things. And so, uh, and most people, I think growing up in sort of east side poor neighborhoods in America, they have that chip on their shoulder to get up and get out. Um, and I chased that and I did that through real estate development. And so I got to build stuff like Ace Hotel in downtown LA and um, you know different housing apartments and was making money and it, things seemed like it should be okay. It should be going well now. But what I started to realize pretty quickly is that wealth was buying me isolation. And uh, that bugged me quite a bit. And again, objectively looking back, 
all of the three, the three institutions, if you will, that I mentioned where I felt the deepest sense of co community, I think we can all objectively say, even college, like, I don't really want to go take finals again. I mean, let's be honest here. Like that, that wasn't, you know, the many sleepless nights in Seaver. That's not something I, I really want to go do again. Um, I don't want to go back to prison. I really don't want to live in Watts impoverished. Um, but I want the community that I, that I had there. And I didn't see, it didn't feel like it existed in America and primarily because I think in as much as capitalism and our love for capitalism here, and it's ingrained in our, in our DNA, um, is powerful and it's a powerful uh, tool for innovation. We also have a incredible sense of rugged individualism and this idea that interdependence in any way is somehow weakness. Um, and then I find, as, as I started to travel, I saw the rest of the world just does not think that way, like community and living together. And they're like, obviously, um, homelessness is less. You know, I went to Nigeria and there were 200 million people and 20 million of those people were in Lagos where I was. And there was a curfew and there was not a single homeless person at every night. And I was like, how is this possible? This is not what they tell me in America. Um, and, uh, you know, a guy looked and said, I'm, I'm my brother's keeper. Um, and I think that that all of these experiences for me, um, and then I, I ran for office and I lost my election. Uh, but shortly after then, uh, first lady Michelle Obama and president Obama invited me to uh, the State of the Union for work I had done in justice reform quietly in community building. And <clears throat> during that time, I was speaking with the president and I said, you know, I, I really love, I really love uh, community, but I'm good at real estate. And he said, figure out a way to do both. And I, I looking back as a bit of sage advice, uh, and sort of with that philosophy in hand, uh, there's a way to do what I love, which is building community um, and filling a sense of community and utilize the technical skills that I had learned over the years um, to do something particularly special. And then I got to meet my co-founder. Uh, in fact, we were pushed in each other's lives three different times uh, until finally we sat down and had a conversation. But he was one of Mark Zuckerberg's roommates and early founding advisors of Facebook and had started a multitude of other community focused um, uh, sort of SaaS software, right? Nation Builder, which is one of the largest political uh, organizing softwares now in the US uh, he created and was just really focused on how do we utilize technology to bring people together? But I think we both came to the realization that uh, when you look at the days of old, what really helped with building community was serendipity. When you look at college campuses, what really helps with building community is truly serendipity. Uh, when, I, when I was at LMU, it was what was it, convocation, if I remember? Um, Correct. And it's the no, it's the the crossing the library multiple times, and you see the same person five times, and then they end up becoming your friend, right? It's not forced, it's not contrived, it's truly serendipity. And the only way to cre create that level of serendipity is through proximity. Um, and in uh, in our real estate market, you now you bring that, take all those big ideas and sort of bring them into the real world. Um, in the real estate market, we have built for capital markets primarily. Uh, the, the adage of build it, they'll come, I think is one of the most harmful plagues when it comes to, or most harmful sayings when it comes to housing. Um, but, you know, we haven't built, um, in my opinion, the, and especially in Los Angeles, look, there's a, there's a gentleman named Ron Finley, uh, the gangster gardener. 
And he says this all the time. Anytime I'm with him, he's like, prophet, man, cities are doing exactly what they're supposed to. They weren't built for community. They were built for commerce. And he's like, why else do you think we have all these big ass roads everywhere? And we have everything cycling to the port or we have straight, we cut Century Boulevard straight from the airport to our Long Beach train line. It's like our cities are built for commerce. Not, they're not built for people. Um, and that made me think and look at our landscape. And I was like, ah, oh, he might be on to something. Um, and when you couple that, uh, you couple the reality that there's a massive amount or there's a, a huge housing shortage in Los Angeles, which is driving prices astronomically high for consumers. And then you couple this with just the reality of our generation. I have a 16 year old daughter um, who drives and all that good jazz now. Many of folks, I hope there's some folks who staff at LMU met her when she was a baby. Um, but now I'm watching her generation and yeah, I was on a, a panel with Vivek Murphy, the Surgeon General, or sorry, I was not on a panel with him. I was on a panel after him. That was a big overstatement. Uh, <laughs> I, was a, I was on a panel a after him and I got to talk to him. I was like, how do I follow this up? But during his panel, he said, and, and this was six weeks before the lockdowns with COVID, he said, um, COVID's a problem. The pandemic's going to be a problem. Um, but human isolation in America is worse than heart disease. It's worse than cancer. It's taking lives at a rapid rate. And uh, that sat with me a lot. And I think that's, that's sort of the beginning, the genesis of Treehouse, which big ideas that we ought to have community there ought to be a, a, a way to facilitate community in a way that through proximity and serendipity that wasn't curated and inauthentic. And uh, the, the final bit is that if I could utilize the fundamentals of real estate, um, which is leaning into density uh, and good, what, what I call good density, um, and I could design in a way, I could design this density in a way uh, that really felt like home. It didn't feel like you were giving up uh, something to live. Like most times people are like, oh, it's like a college dorm. It's like, no, I, actually, I don't know because I've never lived in a college dorm, but I can assure you <laughs> that this is a place that is, that is uh, uh focused on, on human beings. And the unit topology can shift from one bedrooms, two bedrooms, five bedrooms, and where people share like a big episode of Friends, that's less relevant to the um, two fundamentals that you need to minimize some of the over usage of space such that we could build more affordably. Um, and then uh, really have a philosophy that all neighbors know one another. So that's why I'll, I'll stop with the genesis there and jump in with questions. <laughs> well, no, I, I'm, I'm beginning to see the through line, which is very clear to me. It's resilience. It's grit. Uh, you mentioned serendipity. You're, you're at the point where you've, where you're solidifying the thesis, you know, you've, you've, and you, you have this idea. What was the, what was the turn that, that you and your partner made? Was it, we start with a slide deck, we go straight to debt. Um, yeah. You know, just some of the, the ground running. Cause I've, I've been looking at, you know, previous interviews that you've done, which are no surprise to me, where you talk about how long it took you to get debt, how long it took you to get investors. Yeah. And that ratio. If you could expand on that. Yeah, so, so there's a few things. The real estate market is in the real estate market from where I sit in generally is a conservative market. Um, conservative from the individuals, conservative from uh, risk, you know, protection, uh, downside protection. That's a that's a very important uh, 
window that uh, everyone looks at. And from a developer seat, you are trying to convince a tremendous amount of people. You're, you're literally trying to bring a lot of people who do not want to be at the same party together to be at the same party and dance blissfully. Um, <laughs> like they love each other. Well put. And they all have their own separate interests and, uh, uh, and views on the world and how you ought to comport yourself therein. And so you start with the landowner um once you get past your idea and your ideation right i crystallized my idea we built out a deck and we said this is what we're going to do uh then we set out to um, do two things find people that believed in the idea and would give us money for this idea well that quickly it, it quickly became clear that we would not get that funding from real estate investors. That was almost instantly clear um, in that they're like, look, we've been building multifamily apartments for 50, 60 years. I'm not particularly sure why we would change what we're doing here. Um, so that's that was one piece of this. And so chose to raise from venture investors. In fact, one of my first seed investor um, was a gentleman named Michael Birch, who he and I were looking at bringing his private members club to Los Angeles. And it turned out the market, it didn't make sense in the market. Um, and he was the first person I asked to seed this idea uh, for community focused housing. From there, um, I was introduced to Joe through Michael and uh, I was able to convince Joe to come on board with me. Um, there was something about his spirit, his questions, his, uh, his commitment to community that, that was compelling. And so I asked, would he um, come and, and instead of just investing, join me? Um, and I also knew that he had access to the venture tech world that I did not have access to. And I think that's one big thing if I were a student to really look for your allies and strategically think about uh, who are the people that need to be in the room with you because you can't do anything without support, frankly. Um, and so, you know, Joe, it was very clear that Joe could support in, in a multitude of ways. And off we went to try and raise a $5 million seed investment um, based on an idea. And we were going to tech investors telling them that we were going to deviate a little bit and build real estate um, and not software. And so that was a that was an interesting conversation a lot of times, but ultimately people came around to it um, and, and we were able to raise there. But we raised from a multitude of individuals, a lot of individuals, some some venture funds. Um, and we, we were able to get uh, people excited about the bigness of the idea. And I think that was a massive lesson I learned uh, with this. I had, a, I had a gentleman, Corey Davidson, who worked at Studley. He was the head of Studley Real Estate. And he said, Prophet, like you just ran for office. I know you lost, but like you have a special moment to dream big do not waste it. He's like, you could go build one building, but don't waste this moment on one building. Think big. And I think the audacity to that we had to think of something entirely different, entirely new and bigger, um, really played well for us. And then from there, uh, because we're building real estate, ultimately, even though it's a community focused product and it's intended to be a connected uh community brand and probably one of the my goal is one of the most recognized brands in the world uh, for people to live and and have community uh, we still had to deal with real estate folks and so it started with the land ownership they had their belief of what the land was worth um, and buying buying land at the right price and convincing people of your price and most times you don't get to convince them of your price they're convincing you of theirs um, that was a process. And once we were able to get, lock up the land, 
yeah, I then started talking to lenders. Um, we built out our, our, our architectural plans. We did these architectural competitions to what would a building look like that if the entire thing was a home, right? Just think of it that way. What would that, that was the challenge to our architects. And it's like the entire thing has to be a home, but we want every unit to also still have a kitchen. How do you, how do you figure it out? So it's not just one kitchen, it's tons of kitchens, multiple homes, but how do people move about the space and it's a home in its entirety. And we chose to burn the ship at the shore. Uh, Co-living at the time, most people were saying, we're going to be asset light, asset light, asset light. And what they meant is that they weren't going to own any of the real estate and that they were just going to operate the buildings. And for me, when I would Whenever I was asked that question, I would chuckle and say, this is silly because there's no assets that exist for community-focused housing. And unless we build them, they don't exist. So I can never be asset light because there's nothing in the market. Um, and I also was learning from WeWork, right? WeWork built one of the most impressive brands the world had seen to revolutionize and shift culture around office um, but it didn't own any of its assets, or many of them. Uh, Regis does, and Regis is kicking strong. Um, and so we, we looked at that and we said, look, we're going to own the assets. We're also going to operate and build the brand. Lenders then said, listen, man, you're walking into our office with this crazy building. We've never seen anything like it. Uh, no. And they said no about 88 times. Uh, various different lenders. And if you think about that in terms of, and at the time I didn't know about loan brokers, which by the way, we're, from where we started, we're flying high in sophistication. I didn't know about loan brokers that I could hire a loan broker to then go out and talk to lenders for me. So I was calling lenders, code calling lenders and like, relationships and give me, you know, what friend has this relationship with this lender and that whole bit. Uh, so that's, you know, at a minimum, that was probably 120 hours of just people telling me no. Um, and that my idea was crazy. Um, and the same is true. You know, I talked to a thousand plus investors probably. And uh, I think on our cap table, we may have uh, 60 if, if that. Um, of people telling you no to your idea, uh, but that's okay. That's a part of it. <laughs> Amazing, thank you. I'm hearing the serendipity. I'm hearing. Um, I'm hearing the through line of what I've heard from our past speakers uh, come through with you, which is just an indelible spirit and you having to persevere uh, no matter what the cost. I think it's very interesting. I got to give the credit due. This is a brand new product type. It was at a time when exactly as you said, uh, people were going out and saying, no, we're going to be operators. We'll be asset light. I find it extremely fascinating that you chuckled at them, which <laughs> I, I love it. Um, you know, what, what was the thought process in terms of uh, where you're going to, for example, you chose Hollywood, I believe is your first site. You know, mm -hmm. what is the thought process in terms of, all right, uh, this is where we're going to be from a trade area standpoint. This is where we're going to choose to establish roots. And then what does that look like moving forward? Yeah. So Hollywood was somewhat serendipitous, um, honestly. So we, my partner and I at the time, we were looking for assets that um, in as much as our building would be an incredible place to be, we wanted the neighborhood to also be an amenity. Back to this idea of serendipity. How can you walk out and deal with the local artisan and say hi? Um, I'm thinking of Mary Poppins sort of running around saying hi to all the vendors, right? Like that's, how, where does that exist in the city? And so we sort of, we started targeting that. Um, and then we also started targeting um, uh, relative proximity to transit because we, you know, committed that we were going to minimize parking 
Um, but in order to do so, we needed to be responsible. Um, and so that was, that was important to find, you know, what was near transit, uh, what was, what felt like an amenity as a community. And uh, from there we went and we looked and looked and looked and looked all over. We looked relative to zoning and we figured out a, um, a small little arbitrage, um, around some key zoning that has since change to be even more beneficial that increased density with TLC. But at the time it wasn't, but we figured this out and we started running numbers on all performers on all these different properties and they were working. Um, and then one night I, <laughs> it was like 2 a.m., 3 a.m. in the morning. Um, you know, once you, once you fall in love with a thing, um, you're just in it, right? Like yeah, you want it, you want to, you want to keep working on it. It's, it's does not stop. Um, and that one night I woke up at th maybe 2 a.m., 3 in the morning, went on LoopNet and just started looking for properties. That's what we were doing. And uh, the Hollywood property was right there. And I was like, there's no way that this property is real because it was an empty lot. There was nothing I had to do to tear down. The zoning was perfect. The size was perfect. We we had we were running these numbers of like our first community to only be about sixty people because of Dunbar's number and how many people can actually like know one another and interact. And there was a lot of intention there. And I was like, "There's no way that this is for sale." And it was for sale with an entitled building. And I started looking at the building, and I was like, "Oh, I think we could actually." manipulate this building in a way that doesn't require us to full do a full re-entitlement either um and i went to the site the the next day and in fact it was real and we reached out to the broker um so yeah that's that's how that happened with hollywood and then moving forward i think there's about 102 different neighborhoods in los angeles um if, if I have a say on it, we'll end up in just about all of them. Um, one of our, build, a, a tree house building. If you're a resident of one tree house building, you're a resident of all of them. So you can go and interact in the different common spaces in the other buildings. We have a, a host of programming every single Sunday. There's weekly Sunday dinners where 50, 60 people come together and cook and eat together. Um, and it has not stopped without fail since we've opened. Um, you know, pre-pandemic, we had Kamala Harris scheduled to come talk. Patrice Cullors, who founder of Black Lives Matter, lived in our buildings and different speaker series and talks. And a lot of the stuff that you see in modern world happens in our buildings. Um, our second building is in Koreatown, which is something we're deeply excited by. Um, uh, our Ariel, my best friend who I went to school with, she's building um, the building right now. But this building is going to be 50% accessible. So $1,000 or less on 50% of the building. And we were able to do that with a very unique financial relationship with uh, a nonprofit partner, which I'm really excited about because now I can democratize good community and good design uh, to everyone. And so 50% is market and 50% is more accessible in the market. So that's our next building in Koreatown. Uh, we have another building in Lamert Park where we bought a pretty substantial piece of property right on Crenshaw Boulevard. Um, yeah, we bought a, a large uh, property on Crenshaw Boulevard. That one will have 101 units um, that we're pretty excited about. And, and this one, I think, is probably the fullest vision for what we're doing at Treehouse. The building will have a ground floor with a grand central market uh, of local vendors. The next two floors above that will be primarily focused for families, and we'll have playgrounds and shared common space for families, and their two and three bedrooms, and, you know, units open onto the courtyards where parents can feel safe and that their kids are safe. 
And then the floors above that range from spaces for seniors and artists and new graduates and you know just a host of people relative to their their living needs but the unit topology is very uh it's very diverse and we expect that there'll be a tremendously diverse occupancy group of people who are excited and want to know their neighbors and and have community um and so and then from there we uh my team who's fantastic financial team. And we have, we have a Treehouse has a financial arm and a community arm. And the two of them combined are pretty massive, super, uh, super power, a power ranger, I believe. Um, that on the finance side, those folks are, are moving pretty hastily to, uh, and hastily in a positive way to take down and acquire more property in Los Angeles. Um, uh, yeah, and our goal is to, to, you know, get in our pipeline 1200 beds in the next, uh, in the next year and a half or so. And Excellent. that's just in Los Angeles. Um, and then from there, we'll, we'll start expanding from there. Thank you. So to review the, the approach for now is local. Yep. One, one site in as many communities as possible. That is the goal. And um, in addition, it, it's, um, you operate differently. We, we touched on the fact that, that other operators were coming in and saying that they're asset light. What they meant by that, I think, is that they were doing a master lease scenario. Uh, some of them were developers and then they would typically, I believe, uh, uh, work it out with a operator. Uh, Treehouse is not, does not function under that model. It sounds like you folks are vertically integrated and uh, it sounds like you're in this for the long haul. What, what does the exit look like? Is it too, is it too soon to talk about that? Or is it, I'm you know, we'll know when we see it. it. Yeah, I'm too young to talk about an exit. We have a long way to go. I'm only, I'm only 33. We got, we have a long way to go here. Um, no, I, I think if you're strategically looking at this from a real estate perspective, um, our goal is to do as many long-term holds as we can financially stomach. Uh, that is the greatest way to, you know, create wealth for a host of benefits or a host of reasons why. Um, and it's also to ensure the integrity of the product that we're, we're building. And until Treehouse has uh, created for itself an undeniable and clear point of view of what it means to operate a building with community, I think it would be to our detriment of our overall goal to turn that over to other people to, to figure out for us. Um, I think you can look at uh, you could pontificate about how we might exit. Um, I, if I were a betting man, I'd say we're uh, creating a new asset class and that asset class will develop a multitude of uh, REITs and not too dissimilar from uh, um, private student housing and other things that emerged and then came long, you know, large REITs and traded from there. If I'm a dreaming man, which I also am, uh, I look forward to the day that we have a substantial amount of our, our properties that are owned uh, in some way or another by the residents who occupy them and have more uh, actual, yeah. Most multifamily buildings are looked at as like, even from a political standpoint, like they're renters, they're not they don't vote, they don't, they're transient, et cetera. And most renters in America are, I got to go buy my single family home. But the reality of this is that's a, for a lot of people, that's a bygone dream. Those are, those days are gone. Um, you know, it's a, it looks like something like 30 or 40% of all single family housing stock will be purchased by large conglomerates by the end of the next five years. Uh, that are buying these homes at scale and leasing them back to people. Um, this is the case in most, frankly, most places in, in the country, um, or sorry, in the world, where land ownership isn't necessarily the wealth creator for the day-to-day -day individual. Um, I think there's a host of 
there's a host of reasons why uh, many of the students, frankly, in LMU right now will never get to buy a single family home. Um, but having the ability to invest in the place that you live, um, there's a lot of upside for that from a community perspective, from a financial perspective, um, for me raising money perspective, I'd love to uh, have what we're doing benefit the people who are making it as special as it is. Excellent, thank you. Um, how has property acquisition been going uh, you know, given that we're in the pandemic, are you seeing asset pricing coming down? Are you seeing people mark to market in any way? Uh, you know, how does that look moving forward in terms of operating in, you know, I know that you want to be in high density uh, areas that have the potential to have great access to walking and or public transit. And those areas typically are the highest price per square foot. Any insight? Yeah, so well, yeah, I, I do have a little bit of insight. Prices are high, they continue to be high. Uh, and there's always a misunderstanding between people buying the land and the people selling the land on the overall value of that land. And I am not sure that that'll ever change. And I'm not sure if there's a market that that'll ever not be true. But um, what we chose to do is to say we have a competitive advantage in every property that we uh, go after if we continue to build densely and we minimize uh, living rooms, for instance, but bring that experience out to a larger uh, common space. And that allows us to be particularly competitive. Our, the, the amount of density that we're able to create results in a almost a $12 and 60 gross, uh, gross per square foot return from a renting standpoint. But it also from the renter standpoint is typically um, 15 to 20% cheaper than what is local market. And that and the reason that those two things are true at the same time is because of density. Um, but if we if we're going to build a uh, you know, three thousand square foot two bedrooms, then we're at, we're at the same uh, acquisition struggles as every other developer that has to take tremendous entitlement risk that looks at a property you know five ten years down the road um, tries to land bank quite a bit. Um, we would I think we'd be subject to the same same issues there. Our competitive advantage is our density, and our density is palatable because of the community. Mm. You mentioned, so I'm assuming most of these assets are type five construction, concrete, uh, you know, over concrete podium. And I also wanted to touch, you're, you're talking, I didn't know that the Lamert location is going to be organized around family, which is groundbreaking. Um, what are some of the challenges that you're, you're obviously breaking ground in terms of, and breaking records, uh, in terms of providing an asset class and product that is new is, you know, what are some of the things that you're seeing come up from a de design perspective and how do you solve that equation for this new asset class and creating community? Yeah, so, uh, our first property in Hollywood, we took a massive swing on common space, huge. I mean, this is the most well amenitized building ever. And if ever you guys wanna do a field trip or a meet or whatever, I'll gladly go and, and hang. At, we will take you up on it. Awesome. Um, but it's, it's an incredibly amenitized building. It literally, you walk in and it feels otherworldly. There's a coffee shop right when you walk in. There's a um, artist studio that also doubles as a uh, laundry laundry uh, room. And you'll literally go down there any day and there's two or three people doing laundry, music blaring, laughing and playing and five or six people doing some version of art 
uh, from photography to painting or whatever it is. Um, there's recording studios, there's a two-story library for you know rest and relaxation. There's a rooftop oasis that's second to none in the city. Um, and just pretty special. It's too much common space for 60 people. Uh, <laughs> and we took a we took a big swing there and learned a big lesson, uh, one that was somewhat expensive, but it, it was worth it. Um, we also thought that that building would be primarily for single people, whatever their age was. Uh, what we have found and which led us to build Lemert Park in the way that we are is that we have families, we have seniors, we have just everyone in our buildings. Um, even though the typology doesn't necessarily suit the realities of their living uh, needs. And I lived there with for a year, um, myself and my family, we lived there for a year, maybe a little longer. Um, and the key things we learned from a family standpoint is the living room actually matters for a family dynamic. Um, that's not something you could just necessarily kick out uh, or shrink too much. You need some space to congregate in private with one another and still have those moments to, you know, laugh and hang and play relatively comfortably. Um, that's something that we increase the size of. And we, for families, for some of the more shared units, we decrease the size of the living room pretty substantially because we want you to go out to the to the common living areas. But for the families, we actually uh, sort of more so increase those. We put the family units around the courtyard. So one of the one of the most harmful things connected to community, and this is more philosophical and justice reform work that I do, is uh, during the 80s, during basically during the the, the 70s, late 60s, 70s, and 80s, we scared the shit out of the populace in America. Um, we, everything from the war on drug and the crack, you know, crack cocaine and how everyone was going to harm you there to uh, white males as serial killers to the psychedelic communist world. To, we just fear-mongered America to no end and we created tremendous amounts of distrust. And you layer that with race. And we started keeping our kids in the home, right? They, we, we talk to any of our parents or grandparents, they talk about how they played outside all the time. Hell, I played outside all the time. Kids do not do that. I very begrudgingly had to have de dealt with uh, these very structured and crazy play dates and do this and this extracurricular and it like gets pretty frustrating and I looked at that less critical and said well how uh, how could parents feel safe in a modern world for their kids to play outside and one I think is you have to know your neighbors you have to trust them or you have to trust that you know the worst of them at a minimum, right? And such that you could protect yourself from it. And so um, the building for the family areas, we, it was my, my co-founder actually, Joe, really pushed this notion of trying to get as many of the units to open up into the courtyard as possible, such that kids could sort of, if you could just envision a ton of kids running out on the courtyard and you know hanging out in the treehouse. The courtyard, that's where our physical treehouse is actually at. Um, and kids can sort of dream and imagine and really have a, a fun place to be. And parents could feel safe. And uh, it's comfortable for elderly people to sort of come and walk and look at children and are, you know, like uh, look after them. Um, at the end of every single hallway in that neighborhood, there's a communal dining area as well as a, a space that we're still actually designing to be anywhere from a small uh, sort of daycare space. We suspect that the families that move here initially will be younger because um, that tends to be the case in apartments, right? They're younger families, younger children. So, you know, really thinking about 
when I, I back to taking all my experiences, sorry, I'm jumping a little bit, but when I ran for office, the amount of information they made me learn was crazy. And the varied amount of information I was telling someone I would go to Carson and I'd have to be well versed on fracking and oil refinement. And then I'd go to San Pedro and I'd have to be incredibly versed on labor law and how that's impacting unions and stuff like that and the gambit. But one of the most compelling things that I or one of the most frustrating things that I was forced to learn about uh, was early childhood education. And I was like, this is oxymoronic. Why are we, why do I have to debate this? Why is it a conversation? Like, I don't, we should be ensuring that our greatest asset to our posterity is well-educated. Like, I'm not even sure what we're, you're telling me there's someone who doesn't believe this. Um, And it was very confusing for me when I had to like learn the ins and out of this. And I still, to this day, I still have no clue why we're not funding this um, at scale. But within that, uh, the thing I learned in, in growing up in Watts is, you know, when you don't have it, you create it. And um, I watched over and over, um, I watched over and over people Oh, a friend, a friend, another LMU alum, actually, and teacher, he just walked in, one of my best friends. <laughs> um, but um, it, I learned um, pretty, pretty quickly, you build what you don't have, right? You create what you don't have. And I, I think about being uh, the times I've been a single parent, my daughter's mother is a single parent. And the thing that got us all through was a tribe of people looking after our daughter um, and the safety therein and having space for that to happen. So we want to create a space that um, families can leverage each other and, and, and leverage each other for support, for babysitting, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's, that's a key element for the families as well. That's huge. I heard, um, your your experience with politics politics is local real estate is ultimately local so i can see a through line a very clear through line with your experience uh with politics and also real estate we also had a question come in that's i could basically summarize why not just do traditional multifamily? and i think you also answered that just now by saying um you know we build uh if we don't have it, we build it for ourselves, which I, I think is a pretty amazing thesis, but it also goes to uh, the heart of, you know, you could, you could say you're a contrarian on some level. On some level, you could say you're a, prag- a pragmatist, you know. Uh, so I, I find it really fascinating that at all these different touch points, <clears throat> you've said the marketplace is doing this. I'm not going to do that because that's what we've been doing for ever. Yep. And there is a space. There is a space for something different. There is a space for a niche, much in the same way that we have multiple different types of healthcare assets. We can have hospital, we can have hospice, we can have a small footprint clinic, we can have larger uh, outcare, outpatient facility. Mm -hmm. There's there's a space for this. Uh, I find it extremely fascinating that you're gonna include families and you're you're looking at that from a family first standpoint, community first standpoint. Well, this is the this is the pragmatist part of it. Like I'm gonna head out to Germany um, next year, early next year, but this is this is how uh, Germany frankly ended gentrification in places like in some of their major cities. Um, is they they went so far as the government themselves who owns tremendous amounts of the land, they'll just pair you with a developer and you and your 10 friends who want to build an apartment to live together. And they backstop it. They put in the capital for the loans. And then those 10 people then pay the, the rent, but their home is built for them and their friends and families. Um, and it allowed for people to stay in their communities and not be pushed out. The entire country of Denmark down there is built around community, period. 
the ethos is fundamentally community. Um, and they build their homes like our, our ground, um, our ground floor market in Lemur Park is being modeled off of a place in Denmark called Tov Hall. Um, that again, really focused on the local artisan and, and building community in that way as well. And so uh, I think there's some, there's some practical examples in the world. They're just not here in America. Yeah. And I, I think the more we look within, uh, the more uh, this, this will be the future. And I, I, think, I think community, period, will be the future. So community, uh, finding ways for human beings to come back to one another in a way that feels that fills the spirit um, will be important. And I think we'll see master plan developments. Some will be, you know, single family homes. Uh, some will be large scale developments like ours. Uh, but the ethos of community will, I think, will ring pretty loudly. As much as, uh, remember, they're in the real estate world of live, work, play, that silly slogan, I, I think, uh, I don't know, it's silly, that's a little mean. But um, community will be important, I think. Thank you, Prophet. Thank you for your time. Thank you for coming home to speak to us at LMU. Uh, we look forward to having you back again. We will follow up with you so that we can have students visit uh, you know, your sites and, and maybe do a hard hat tour uh, at Lemur. We really appreciate you. We appreciate your time so much. Uh, of course, any anytime. Um, LMU family is welcome. And so just, just always uh, reach out and uh, I'll, I'll be there. How do we follow? How do we follow Treehouse? Um, Treehouse Colive is Treehouse Colive. And uh, I think you could take it, take it from there and take